Liz Clayman of Fox Business Network. Liz, welcome back to the FDH Lounge. On a night like this, with all the news in Cleveland sports, I'm honored. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? It's it's one of those things, Liz. You know, we, we, last time you were on, you kind of reminisced about going to games at, at the stadium back in the day, and, and those were oh, some yeah. difficult times, you know, going during uh, the Belichick years and everything. <laughs> ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You know, we've we got a Belichick clone <laughs> running the team now, and it's just like it was, I think, when you were going to games. You know what? And Belichick, boy, he didn't do much for the team, you know, and then he goes to the Patriots, and he's all wonderful and everything. But, but yes, you know, I have to tell you that we used to go in the old gray lady and watch those games freezing with the big blankets over us and and the wind whipping off from Lake Erie and there was nothing like it and to this day I make a big deal on Fox Business about the Browns you know oh they just won two games I call that a winning streak forget it I'm I'm the Browns girl on the national cable spokesman or person as far as I'm concerned well you know I Mike Holmgren coming to town now and and, and yeah one can only hope, Liz, that in the years to come, you know, you'll have a lot more to brag about. I think that'll be the case. This is a classic market bottom, and you always want to buy at the bottom <laughs> because there's nowhere to go but up. Thank you. Way that's to my tie statement it back. about the Browns. Excellent. Way to tie it to the business <laughs> stuff here. That's excellent. I have to say, too, before we go any further, I said earlier tonight, as far as I'm concerned, we're giving you the award for the line of the year in the FDH Lounge uh, from the previous time on here. And, and we've had a lot of witty folks on here with us. You're, you're stepping over quite a lot of people to get that award. But when you were talking about leaving CNBC and how it wasn't necessarily in your mind preordained you were going to Fox Business Network and you were considering some other things. I think you mentioned Animal Planet. And then you just kind of threw out... Or I could become the first Jew on Al Jazeera. I, mean, <laughs> I know. We were I know. dying, Had they Liz. offered. Uh, yeah, it actually didn't come to that. I, I didn't end up, obviously, going to Al Jazeera. But it, I'll tell you something. There are going to be times in all of your listeners' lives where you're faced with some interesting choices. And I'll quote Susie Orman, the big financial superstar who's, who's still on CNBC. And she said, you know, Lizzie, when you're faced with with a really, really tough decision, you can do the right thing or the easy thing. The easy thing is rarely right, and the right thing is never easy. And the right thing for me was to leave CNBC after nine years, and, and I didn't know where I was going. I couldn't see around the corner. I took that flying leap and a chance, and honestly, at Fox Business, I have never been happier. And we're the little guy. We're the, the little kid on, on the block. We're the baby on the block, so to speak, and everyone's taking swipes at us. But we've got Don Imus now, uh, big, big moves, uh, certainly in viewership since he joined on board in the morning. And I would, I would challenge anybody to say that we are doing such interesting business television. We were the only ones today to take the Democrat um, uh, group coming out after the third cloture vote. Senator Reid, when I say only ones, only business network, we, we took it live. We are really focused on people's money, what it's going to look like in the next couple of years, and it's not necessarily a stock market story. It could be a policy story, a government story, a tax story, and uh, we're very committed to that, and we've broken a lot of rules in doing so that other business networks have never bro broached, and I'm just very proud to be part of this, this uh, startup network. You, you referenced something in, in the, uh, your previous appearance on the show, and I really, really like liked it because of my own you know, political and, and public policy views that I have. But what you were talking about with Fox uh, Business Network was putting an emphasis on small business mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to exclusively big business as it is with the other things here, with, with the coverage, you know, it's CNN, CNBC, whatever the case may be. Understandably, okay, there's, there's going to be some keying on Wall Street, and that's where a lot of the important things go down. But it's really important, I think, to have outlets like the one that you're at because, again, I'm one of these people – you know, call it cheesy, whatever you want. Small business is the backbone of this company, of this country, not big business. And it's just great to have you guys shine in a spotlight. It's not cheesy. It's fact, Rick. And and you're absolutely right that we. I, I hear differing numbers, but small business, I would say, employs minimum 70 percent of all the employees in this nation. And if you turn your back on them. Are they, are they traded on the New York Stock Exchange? No, but neither was, was IBM in the early days and Microsoft and, and Intel. I mean, these, all, these businesses all started, well, let's just use the ones that, that, in Ohio, Parker Hannafin or, or, or the Limited. They all started as small businesses, and you've got to focus on these guys because they grow up. 
just like Fox Business is going to grow up, but they grow up, and they they are, are real drivers of this nation. And as you see, President Obama has put a lot of focus on small businesses. So we're covering that a lot because we know it matters to people. We're not a stock channel. We're a business channel, and we're a money channel. And we're the ones who are focusing on that. I mean, when I worked at CNBC, and they, they do what they do very, very well, but it's a small, very sort of trader audience but I would pitch these ideas of these incredible little companies, and I would, uh, well, is it publicly traded? Can I make money off it? No, forget it. And, and I get that. I mean, that's what they did, and that's fine. But we're broadening the aperture, and I think that's important, especially to a state like Ohio. You know, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. And I'm from California, where they used to say that about California. But it's true about Ohio, whether it's the political landscape or business or sort of that real AccuWeather, real feel of, of who America is in many, in many regards. And so, yeah, I'm with you on that. Small business, we focus on it. We have small business reports all the time. It's not just a once-a-week kind of thing here at Fox Business. That's really important. And you know what? I think in many ways... That you know, obviously, yeah, you know, Ohio, you know, geographically, everybody's always noticed is a microcosm of the country as far as how it's shaped. But yeah, I think also, you know, the actual composition of of the state, and when you look at a lot of the problems that Ohio has, and I think when you were here, things were just starting the spiral as far as the death of the steel industry and some of the long term structural problems that have been happening here. I think what you guys are doing is pretty important because a place like Ohio and probably the country as a whole, is not going to turn around by conventional means. Right, it's going to be right. innovation. It's going to be people coming up with stuff that we haven't heard of yet. Where was Twitter two years ago? And we just talked about it in the previous segment. The Amen. Take the world. Yeah, I mean, I remember when Google came on the landscape and, and there was an article saying if you're going on a blind date, there's a new verb, Google him. You know, you can, and nobody had heard of this. This was, you know, early 2000s, and, and everybody was saying, well, whoa, whoa, what is that? And, and look at it now. It just breached $600 a share. Hello? I mean, these things start small in people's garages, in people's back offices or their parents' basements, and they turn in. That's America, though. That's America, Rick. And, and it's that entrepreneurial spirit that we try and capture. And, but we're also realistic. We're not sitting there with rose-colored glasses, always no wonderful. It's a tough, tough landscape out there. And everybody in Ohio knows that. They've experienced it at the moment. And frankly, I, I just look at this nation and I say, this is the beauty of it. People hang tough. And I, I want to tell that story every day. And Neil Cavuto tells it, and I tell it, and Cheryl Cassoni, and, and Don Imus. And uh, we're, we're the ones trying to really get out there and, and tell the story. Adam Shapiro, who worked at Channel 5 in yes. Cleveland with me. We've got a lot of Ohio people. And, and I think that I couldn't, I was just at dinner tonight, and I said, I've got to go, I'm going to go talk to the, the lounge and, and this radio show in Cleveland. And, and I said, you know, you've got nothing if you don't have the state of Ohio. You've got nothing if you don't have the Midwest. It, you, that is very much an important aspect of this nation as far as the business picture. It's, it's a whole mosaic. So that's why I've always felt very fortunate that I ended up spending a good eight years of my life in Ohio. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the lessons that people uh, learn from, from living here, uh, you know, they certainly make you tougher, you know, if for no other reason than dealing with the weather, but, you know, the economy and everything else like that. Yeah, I, I can see where that would, uh, you know, be beneficial uh, you know, in your development, in, in terms of where you're at now, it's really interesting to see uh, uh, Fox Business Network. Uh, you know, now bringing on board uh, John Stossel. You know, with, with his point of view being added to the mix. Uh, you guys are, are are good and experimental with what you do about some different things here too. Uh, my producer Steve Cervillo said to ask you also. I guess there was a segment that you did with Geraldo recently, uh, yeah. something of involving pajamas. I mean, that that's an interesting <laughs> touch as well. I channeled my inner Hugh Hefner. It's actually out there on the Twitter universe, or so, you know, we. I think we. It's up there. We put on pajamas because there was a company again, small small business. They're manufacturers in, in apparel. Never heard of them, you know, pro- probably. Um, they're they're in New York, and and these guys, they decided because the wife of the the owner, the CEO, uh, has juvenile diabetes, that they were going to donate. 100% of the proceeds of these pajamas for the holiday season to, to curing juvenile diabetes. And Geraldo, who's a dear friend of ours, he lives two houses in front of us on the Hudson River, he said, Lizzie, will you come and put these pajamas on? I said, heck yeah. You know, you've got to give back to the community. You've got to help out those 
who who physically are are ill or or got the short end of the societal stick, whatever it is, we live in the greatest nation, in my opinion, on the planet. I mean, this isn't just some little patriotic speech, but I feel so fortunate to live in America. I've traveled the world extensively, and you can't count on walking down the street in other countries and not having a bag thrown over your head and kidnapped or your throat slit, God forbid. In in America, we're we're generally quite safe, and and to a great extent, we got to pay for that, and we've got to give back. And not everybody, not everybody is born with all their faculties and two parents and a roof over their head and and the two and a half cars and the one dog. There are people who got the short end of the societal stick, and and it, the onus is on us to help them and and help those who are sick and help out and be generous with what we can. And so Fox always does that, you know. Can I say that's Fox Business too? Very good points, yeah. Because you know, corporate responsibility is is very important. And may I say also too, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, pajama video is going to blow up on YouTube before the year is out. <laughs> but that uh, it wasn't that exciting. They were more of those those like Hugh Hefner pajamas. They uh-huh. weren't the sexy lingerie. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, everyone's been warned. But that uh, no, that that is you know, that's great. You got to mix in some stuff like that. On yeah. the other show there, you, you got to have uh, a good take on that. I'm just curious, you know, in, in, in the theme of tonight here on the program with looking back at the last decade, looking ahead of the next decade, I'm curious because this is the decade here where between you know, CNBC and, and, and Fox uh, Business Network where you really spent your time immersed uh, in the business world, uh, you know, whether it be Wall Street or some of the other aspects of it, as things were happening, as we were getting to this point with the, the bubble that was generating over time, whatever you want to mm-hmm. trace it to, whether it's when sure. the, the, the interest rates hit, what was it, I think 1% back in 2003, whenever it was, yeah. was there ever anything in your head where you were kind of thinking to yourself, like, oh, geez, you know, this oh, is yeah. going to Yeah, and I'll tell off. you why. I don't come from a Wall Street or trader background. I come from the news background, of course, Columbus, Cleveland, Boston. And when I got to CNBC in 1998, it was the start of the dot-com explosion. So people were, in, were buying up things like e-toys and the globe.com and a lot of stuff that doesn't even exist anymore. And um, I didn't know from bubbles. So I was watching this thinking, oh, okay, here's a, the Cornell grad who's worth $90 million on paper because they founded some lame company that, that doesn't even exist today anymore. And uh, I just watched it all happen, and then it blew up. So I thought to myself, okay, well, the next time we recognize this, we're, we're not going to let this happen again. Sure enough, starting with the housing boom, and it got bigger and bigger, and people were flipping condos, and uh, people I knew in California who made a decent living couldn't afford housing because it was skyrocketing. So I think around 2006, I asked the question to a guest on CNBC, this sort of smells like a bubble again, doesn't it? When I tell you, Rick, I got hate mail, you're trying to tear something down that's good for once. It's different this time. Real estate will always increase in value, and you're so pessimistic, and you're an- this is what I got, you're anti-patriotic. Yeah, I got hate email, big time. And I'm thinking, well, okay, but you know, this looks like the same exact thing to me. You and if you what? take all the emotion out of it of, oh, wow, my neighbor just got this, and now he bought something in Florida, and then he flipped it for $100,000 more, and you look at it for what it is, you try and see clearly through the nebulae that are out there and all the clouds and the things that skew the, the sort of the vision, and you can see when a bubble's a bubble. Good for you for calling that because, you know, there, there weren't enough people that were. And as, as you say, having gone through the dot-com bubble, it wasn't that many years thereafter that, mm. uh, you know, the Fed and everybody else started reinflating this new one. i, I got to ask you, too, as we're sitting here, we we're, were talking more in a general headline basis earlier in the show, but looking at you know, some of the big stories of the last decade, we rated the financial bubble as being number two only behind 9-11 for the last decade, and something that we noted probably would have been number one had it been in any of the last couple of decades. But in in looking at that, looking ahead to the next decade, we just said, hate to be pessimistic, but, I mean, we're piling on the red ink on top of everything else. I mean... It's you, you want to believe in innovation. You want to believe mm-hmm. that these companies that you're covering at Fox Business Network, maybe one of them is going to rise up and save us somehow. Maybe there's another Bill Gates in the bunch. But, I mean, on paper, doesn't it feel hard to look at the 2010s and say, man, I know this is going to be way better than the last 10 years? 
Uh, it is difficult. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you this. I'll say this much about America and, and Americans. We do fight hard to bounce back. But this housing implosion that triggered all of the, the, the financial crisis, and a lot of it was based on this, this fake cloud of credit, uh, that's a lot harder to come back from than in just one year. I'm pretty worried slash stunned slash disbelieving that how is it that Goldman Sachs and, and a lot of the banks were on the brink a year ago, September, and suddenly they're giving bigger bonuses than they ever gave before the, the financial crisis, and they're making a lot of money. Is that real? I, I really wonder about that. I would believe that there's a lot of really dirty stuff on books that can't be seen at the moment that at some point will probably uh, shake out at the top and come through, you know, like dross, you know, when you, when you melt metal, the, the really icky stuff comes to the top eventually. And I'm wondering, I have to believe that that's got to come out at some time. Couple that with the incredible spending that the government has done to try and stabilize things. And how can we possibly believe that we're suddenly just fine again? We're not. We're not. I, I mean, I'm telling you, we're not. That's why you have to completely change your behavior, live not just within your means, but as Dave Ramsey, who does our 8 p.m. primetime show, says, live beneath your means for a while. Get used to that. Get used to what it feels like to deny yourself certain things. Make a kitty, make a bigger nest egg that, that's pretty darn safe if you can, and, and just hunker down a little bit. We became a very excessive nation. I'm guilty too, Rick. I bought three flat screen TVs in one fell swoop before the financial crisis. I don't know. We were coming up on the Super Bowl. We were having a party or something. I'm thinking we got to do this. I will never do that again. I am so paranoid now that I call it the upside-down shampoo bottle syndrome now. People are turning the shampoo bottle upside down just to get that last quarter inch now. They're changing their behavior. We all should. That is, uh, that's excellent uh, advice. And, and when you talk about you know, the things that were happening and, and everything that, that led up to this, uh, th this crash and, and, and everything like that, uh, another gentleman that we spoke with about this, uh, Bill Cohen, author of the House of Cards, uh, book which was just really outstanding in its own right you know sure it, we, we were talking about that with him and, and you mentioned also about the payoffs right now to the executives and, and with the cumulative effect of everything referenced in bill's book and things we talked about tonight that led up to this you talking about the you know the the year-end bonuses which are back with a you know with, with a real vengeance now here at this point factor in the bernie madoffs and the other people like that who are sort of the face of the crisis in, in that realm i mean it, it's going to take a lot to get the american people feeling good about business again and that in and of itself is probably unhealthy the people yeah, can't it, believe doesn't, in the system. it doesn't pass the smell test and i would ask your listeners to to just personalize it and say as far as the banks are concerned and believe me i'm all for for companies doing really well and making profits i don't think that profits are a bad thing at all however uh, if you ran into trouble and couldn't pay your mortgage and you went to your good friends and neighbors, whatever, and said, I need ten grand," and those across the street neighbors gave it to you and said, okay, you know, all right, I'll lend this to you, and then all of a sudden you start throwing big parties and start driving up in Lamborghinis and things like that, your neighbors would be looking and saying, that does not pass the smell test. That's just not cool. And when you look at some of these companies which have extricated themselves from the TARP money and paid it back, it doesn't look good still that you're throwing this money around because we just saved you, okay? The taxpayer just saved these people. And I don't know about you, Rick, I never bought a credit default swap. I never bought a mortgage-backed security, all of these risky, risky investments that unwound the entire system. Yet, you and I had to bail out these companies and save them. And, and that includes the Morgan Stanleys of the world and the Goldman Sachs's and, of course, the AIGs and the city groups. And cities making a big deal, oh, they just, they just paid back the money. Well, they also got the IRS to forgive a $38 billion tax bill. I want that deal. I'm not going to get it, though. And if I had a business and it came to the brink of failure, trust me, it would go under. Okay? So when you've gotten the taxpayer to save you, have a little humility. Yeah. Have a little humility and keep it low for a year or two. I mean, would that really hurt them? It just, it, it really bothers a lot of Americans. And again, I'm pro-free market, 
All right. I, I w- would have let some of these companies fail, although when you talk to guys like Buffett and, and Gates, they say you had to save them or else I would have walked up to my Citibank account to try and get money out of the ATM and it might not have been there. Mm-hmm. Can't have that in a de- developed society. Okay, so that's what we pay for. Save us and make sure everything remains stable. Fine. But don't then shove it in my face that you're handing out 700000 to $5 million bonuses. I don't like it. Do you? Yeah. I, that exactly too big to fail is, is just an execrable con, you know concept you know I mean it, it exists I hear you I you know I, I I've argued with friends of mine that were against tarp I I hate it with a passion but what I would have hated even more I've used the Mad Max example you know you get up right. the next day currency's worthless and you're shooting people for loaves of bread it beats that just because yeah, anything yeah. beats that scenario well I wish you could have been in New York or not because. Right around September, everywhere you went, everybody had the black helicopter theory. I know a lot of hedge fund guys and the parents at my kid's school and all of this, and they were all, they had black circles under their eyes. They were terrified. They were taking cash out and shoving it under the bed because they thought we were going to have some Mad Max scenario. And, and I remember calling my, <laughs> my, my family in the entertainment business in California saying, take money out this weekend. The whole thing's going to implode. And, of course, it didn't because... Paulson and, and Bush stepped in, and then Obama and Geithner. Now, I just came back from D.C. from a couple of weeks ago where I sat down with Treasury Secretary Geithner, and the guy's under fire. Boy, did he look mad. He's over it. He doesn't want too big to fail anymore. He doesn't ever want to have to bail out these companies because, you know what, it, it's not a good thing. And, and if they think that we'll be there again, they'll do it again. They'll do it again. So we've got to send that message uh, through our elected officials, that, that that really is not a good thing to do. And, and uh, you know, I, I'll look at all of this and I'll say that I've talked to the Mary Shapiro, the, the commissioner of the SEC, um, and they're looking into the next bubble, which is always the question, what is it, Liz? People always think, what's the next bubble? And, and I have a couple of theories. I bet you've never heard of dark pools. Do you know what that is? Uh, these, are, these are sort of highly unregulated trading floors that are popping up all across the nation. And there are these private trading floors where big guys can put through trades, but you can't see them, and they're not regulated because uh. they don't want people to follow the, the trail. They don't want people to see what they're trading, and they're, they're legal at the moment. But what if there are so many of these now, and there are so many trades that aren't counted, and suddenly something happens, and the, the horses get spooked, and everybody runs for the exits, and we've got another problem on our hands. And Mary Shapiro of the SEC is trying to see what the next bubble is, and we don't want to be – six-year-old soccer players, you know, kids who are on little peewee soccer teams, they only go where the ball is at that minute. You want to go where the ball's going to be. And that's probably not the hedge fund world. It's not going to be the big banks who have had their hands slapped. It's going to be something that we don't really know about right now. So we're trying very hard to look at the next bubble that will burst and really hurt us. Is it commodities? I don't know. Gold seemed to flame out a little bit, but it, it has really reared its head. Their gold parties, like Tupperware parties now, is that, is that a bubble? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say, but it behooves the financial journalism world to take that skeptical eye and, and cast it everywhere now. Not it, be totally pessimistic and not be anti-business. I'm totally pro-business, but it's our job because I'll tell you, the ratings agencies, they triple rated, triple A. This is secure and wonderful. All these mortgage-backed securities that imploded. You can't trust anybody now. So, you know, we try as, as the world of journalism to say, boy, we better do it because these guys certainly failed at their job. Oh, no, you're right about that. You, and you just gave us some good clip and save stuff uh, to look for, you know, as far as what, uh, what might uh, end up going down here. Uh, I just got a note from uh, our producer, uh, the New York Bureau, who uh, indicated that uh, we're going to be having on uh, Lawrence McDonald, author of A Colossal Failure, The Collapse of Lehman Brothers. So mm, I'm sure he's going to have yeah, some. Yeah, that's a good get. Uh, the, Lehman, what a story. And, and a lot of those guys, some of them at least, were absorbed by Barclays, which bought pieces of Lehman Brothers. But there are a lot of Lehman families around New York City that Lehman had this structure where they were paid in stock and they couldn't cash it out, like the divisions of Lehman, such as Newberger Berman that Lehman bought. They got paid in Lehman stock but then couldn't sell it for five years. And guess what happened? Before the fifth year or so, um, Lehman imploded. And... A lot of people lost a lot of money on paper, but listen, in your mind, it looks pretty good. I have $15 million. I have $21 million. I was paid that. 
it's hard it's hard to swallow of course for the average individual oh my gosh i'd take a million i'd take a hundred thousand but uh it's something that we have to watch very carefully and, and these bubbles rear their heads very quickly and then flame out let, let me give you the mini bubble of oil a year ago mm-hmm. july oil hit 147 dollars a barrel today it's half that 76 dollars a barrel everybody thought Oh, oil's gonna, we're running out of it. It's always gonna be $150 a barrel. It's going to 200 There were books written. $200 a barrel oil. Never happened. Oh, yeah, there was, there was a great thing on, on, on your sister network, uh, FX, uh, there was an episode of uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where the guys were trying to buy big barrels of oil. Oh, it can only go up. We'll be able to sell this for three times the price next year. Store it in the garage. Yeah. No, don't. It's very dangerous. But, right. but how about rice? Uh, um, I, I believe it was about a year ago, rice skyrocketed in price because there was one monsoon that blew up. I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden Costco was hoarding rice. You could only get two gigantic bags per customer. Mm-hmm. So restaurants in Manhattan were sending in 12 people to get two bags each, and then that imploded. Sugar recently reared its head and saw a pretty significant highs and then back down. You've got to be really careful because trees don't grow to the sky. That's true. That's true. You know, people need to focus on uh, fundamentals and, you know, just really look at uh, the root causes of these matters. And, you know, we, we talked about it the previous time when you were on the program with us here. You know, whether it be the fact that you came to business journalism after uh, practicing uh, the other, you know, uh, things, you know, in here of, of doing local news, whatever it is, you know, that shaped you along the way, you have a great way of being able to break it down for people is make it discernible for people, something that they can, can reach. I mean, you do an excellent uh, job. But I mean, you're you're one of our Thank favorite you. guests here on the program. We'd love to have you back in 2020. I am I am your girl. I'll tell you something. Um, my heart lies in Cleveland, and I mean that. I've never met greater people. And of course, when I worked at Channel Five, Ted Henry, Wilma Smith, Don Webster, the whole gang, Lee Jordan, all those people. Oh my gosh! And and uh, uh, I, I try and explain to people the Cleveland. But, you know, my dad did his residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in the 50s, and when I got the job in Cleveland, I was in Columbus at Channel 6, and I was trying to get back to California. The only place that would hire me at the time was Cleveland, and I was kind of lamenting, Cleveland, I didn't want to go north, I wanted to go west. And my dad said, oh, oh, wait a minute, this will end up being one of the best experiences of your entire career. You will love that city. And they opened their arms to me. The whole station, Channel 5, was fantastic. Uh, we were friends with everybody over at 8 and, and 3 as well. And, and, and then, of course, Sam and Maria Miller, the big you know, cornerstones of, of the, the city and, and the Cleveland Clinic and the whole gang. And we're, we're just in awe of Cleveland. Well, you know, and that's the fun thing, too, you know, in talking to uh, friends and family and everything like that, and we're telling them about what we're doing with the program every week, and, you know, and the, this time when we've had you coming on, just like the last times, you know, it, it's great, too, you know, the people around here, they know you're from the national stuff, but, but that's how it is coast to coast, but people also remember you from the local stuff, and people well, say, well, oh, it's great you're I hope they'll find on. me on Fox Business, where we're getting picked up by more and more people, and, and, and I hope I'm an example to people to take a chance in life, because I was at the so-called world leader in business news, and I could have stayed there. And and my dad always taught me, you know, history looks kindly upon those who take chances in life. And, and I could have stayed and been very comfortable, but I wanted to do something that would give me a real shot at, at, a, at an amazing experience, like building something from the ground up. And it, look, has it been easy? No. There have been times where people are saying, does anybody have a pen? I mean, we're a startup. Granted, we've got the Fox brand behind us, but we're very separate from Fox News. Um, and we're not Fox News. We're completely different from Fox News. And I, I look at this and I say to people, look, I, I went to Berkeley. I'm from California. I've actually hugged trees, okay? I mean, and I've never been happier at a place where they give me the ball and say, we don't care where you run with it. Just go as fast as you can and, most, and, and as smart as you can. And we've got all kinds at Fox Business, and that is what matters. And we also all cheer each other on, which is completely different from where I used to work, where you know, a lot of people are very competitive in this world. But again, I, I could have stayed, but that's, it was sort of that chance that brought me to Cleveland, that brought me to Fox Business, where it didn't look on the surface like the right thing for me, and it ended up being the best. So for everybody out there who's wondering, should I take a chance on something where I can't see around the corner, or I don't know how deep or how cold the water is, dive in and go for it. You'll never regret it. That's great advice uh, for people, and and I'll tell you what uh, too. As as I've referenced here, this uh, this show that you're on with us uh, tonight, this episode, 
uh, where we're looking back the entire night and looking ahead at the next uh, decade here. We've got an FDH Lounge ebook that uh, we're doing as part of the show here tonight that we have released. I'm going to send it uh, via email to your colleague, uh, oh, Kaylee, nice. whose email address I have, and ask her to uh, pass it on to you. Uh, Absolutely. It's that- Come visit us. I'd love to. I'd lo- I've New York. been to NYC. I keep telling the New York Bureau I'm going to make it out there. I'll look you guys up uh, and, you know, in the interim. Love to have you back in 2010, Liz. It's always a pleasure. You got it. I'm yours whenever you need. Thank you so much, Liz. The go great- Browns. Go Browns. Go Browns, yes. <laughs> go Browns, go Holmgren. All right. All right. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. The pleasure's all ours. The great Liz Clayman, everybody, from Fox Business Network, always a pleasure to have her on the program.